Okay. Evening and welcome to Bible School. Uh, welcome to those who are online. Welcome those who are in church. Um, if you want to get your tablets out, your Bible out, your phone out, whatever you look up the Bible with, we're going to do some digging tonight around uh, the subject of walking by faith. Um, so right at the beginning, can we just pray? Let's ask God to help us. Um, if you're watching online, just join in with us. We know that many, many people will be watching online and maybe not watching now, but watching later on. But wherever you find yourself tonight, we just want you to be touched by God. So let's just pray. Father, I just pray right now that you will just open your word to us. Father, we're desperate for your presence. And Lord, I just pray that as you come, Lord, thank you that you are here on Sunday. Thank you that you were touching lives. Thank you that you were transforming people. Thank you that you were healing people. Thank you that you were setting people free. And tonight, Lord, as we come around your word, we expect that same result, Lord, as we preach the truth, that that truth will set us free. So, Lord, I just pray right now that you just speak to us very clearly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I guess the most important thing that I can teach you, um, well, there's two things that I've always found to be absolutely essential in terms of our faith and what we got is one, that we trust God and his word. And two, that our ears are open to what God is saying. So the Bible says his sheep hear his voice. And it's really, really important that as God's people, that we know and trust our God. Because when we do that, we're never going to fall. We're never going to move out of the way. God's always going to keep us because we're listening to his voice. He's guiding us. He's changing us. He's shaping us. So really, that's what tonight's uh, message is all about. So... We're going to start, if you've got your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Some of the verses I'm going to read to you, I'm going to read from the Amplified, but most of them are from the New International, so you should be able to follow along if you've got the NIV. We're going to try and make a definition of what faith is, because some people, you kind of get all mixed up about faith. You say to somebody, what's your faith? They say, oh, I'm Church of England, or I'm, I'm Catholic, or I'm... You know, I'm, I'm a Muslim or I'm a Hindu or a, I don't have any faith. But faith is all about a person. It's not about a creed. It's all about putting our trust in Jesus. So this is what Hebrews says. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is confident in what we hope for, for the assurance of that which we do not see. For this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith they understood that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was made out of that which was visible, not visible. So God created everything by the power of his word. And here, the righteous of the Hebrews is trying to define for us faith. And what faith is, is that we're persuaded, we're assured, and our trust is in God and in his word. I don't know about you, but we don't really have a faith if we can't trust our God. We don't really have a faith if we can't trust his word. So many people go, well, I don't know whether God actually meant, meant what he said. I don't understand what God's saying. We need to understand what God's saying and we need to put our faith and trust in him. And the last time we were together, we looked at a psalm. And if you want to underline this, you can have a look at it at your leisure. But in Psalm 20, the psalmist said that some people they trust in horses and some people they trust in chariots. He said, but we will trust in our God. We'll trust in God. And that's what faith is, putting our trust in God. Not just him as a person, but what he says. You know, it's important when, who says what to you? You know, if I say that I'll mow your lawn, I won't, because I don't like even mow my own lawn. But if I say to you, I'll mow your lawn, right, you, you know, because I'm a man of my word, then I will at some point mow your lawn for you. Uh, don't presume I'll do that unless I say it, but if I say it, you can trust me. How much more we God? Well, if he says it, we need to trust him, don't we? Because he keeps to his word. So we're trying to form a, a definition of what faith is. And I've written this down. It's single-minded, unwavering trust and assurance in God and his word. It's assurance in God and his word, not in this church or the pastor. Because church will let you down. The pastor will let you down. People around you, your friends will let you down. It's just the way of the world because we're not God. So we let each other down. We're humans. We don't always do what we promise to do. But that's not the same with God. God is unwavering. What he says, you can take to the bank. You can trust it with all of your heart. So faith is that trust, that total reliance on what God says, that what he says he will do. 
And uh, it's a real anchor for our souls, God's word is. And I've written this down here that faith is not a creed, it's a relationship. Faith is not a creed, it's a relationship. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please anybody. Because if you don't trust me, then we don't have a relationship. And God is wanted to have us close to him. He wants us to have that relationship with him. And I don't know where you find yourself today, whether you're online or in the house. There's some new faces in here tonight, which is fantastic. But the key to walking with God is to trust him, to take him at his word, to listen to what he has to say to you, and just place your feet upon it. There's so many people in this world that don't have any firm place to stand. They don't know what's going to happen next. They don't know where they're going. But I want to tell you tonight, we are really, really privileged because the people who know their God, the Bible says we'll do exploits. And the only reason we can do the stuff that we do is because we can trust him. Because what he says, it always fulfills. Hebrews 10 and verse 23. Get this down. It says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who has promised is faithful when we, we looked at a verse didn't we just before the christmas break he said a verse that says god is not a man that he should lie or a human being that he should change his mind so what the apostle is saying to me is look you need to understand that when you're putting your trust in god you're putting your trust in the one that will never change will never move He's God, he's totally God, and there is none like him. He's not like us. We change our mind with the wind, we change our mind with our emotions. Sometimes we intend to do what we said we'd do, but we don't do it. But God's not like that. When you, God says something in his word, you can take it to the bank. You can build your life on it. So we go back to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Let's just try and unpack this a little bit. Now, faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. So it's talking about faith and insurance in God, but faith and insurance in God for what? The things that are not yet and the things that are not seen. Like, I don't need faith in God for yesterday because yesterday is gone. So yesterday's faith has been spent. I don't need to trust him for the past. He's seen me through the past. Today I'm in the present, but I don't know about you, as you look at your life, as you think about the bills, as you look at in your family and you've got the concerns of all the stuff that goes on in your life, maybe your work, that's where we need faith, not just faith to trust God that he saved us, because I hope that we all tonight have given our lives to Jesus, but that the God that saved us is the God that's going to lead us forward in every situation that we're going to meet. So how difficult it might be that God is with us. So faith is trusting God in the not seen and the not yet. There's some stuff in front of us that we can't see and has not happened yet, but I can tell you that the God that led us from yesterday to today will lead us on. And the Bible says something about Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. If he was faithful yesterday, he's faithful today. And he's going to be faithful tomorrow. And as we look in the uh, Hebrews chapter 11, he starts to give us some examples of people who had that kind of faith. Hebrews 11 is a fantastic chapter. If you get a chance, just read it several times, digest it a little bit. And I'm going to read some of these verses from the Amplified Bible. Now, I told you on Sunday, the Amplified Bible is just a version of the Bible where it puts extra words in the brackets. So it helps us understand more what the text is actually saying. It draws from the original um, Greek and Hebrew, and it gives us the extra words. So it expands it a little bit. So this is what, this is what it says about Noah in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, and then in the brackets said, with confidence in God and his word. So already we've started to see that faith is being confident in God and what God says. So it says, by faith, Noah, being warned about the events not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark of salvation for his family, by this act of obedience, in brackets, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which comes by faith. So God speaks to Noah about something that he's not seen and not yet, doesn't he? Now, if you read carefully the uh, account of Genesis, and the, we are those in this church that believe in the Bible from cover to cover, and we are the ones that believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I've told you before, you know, a big bang only produces chaos. If you throw a hand grenade into your garage, you will not get a fully working Mercedes Benz out of the end of it. You will just get a whole lot of mess. And so we believe that God created the world with purpose and with understanding. And one of the things that you read in Genesis is that 
when God created that Garden of Eden, he watered it. He didn't water it from rain. Anybody hate the rain? I hate the rain. If there's anything worse than the cold, it's the cold and the rain. But rain was not here on the earth when God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says that a dew would come up in the morning and refresh all the plants. Wouldn't that be nice? It's like sub, sub crop, tropical. It was divine sprinklers. Do you know what I mean? No rain, just the divine sprinklers every morning. No one had ever seen any rain and nobody had definitely not seen a flood. There were pockets of land, of course there was, and, the, and the pockets of water and sea. And God had created the heavens and the earth. But there's never been a great storm and there's never been a flood. And yet God spoke to Noah about something that was not yet and not seen. And it says that by faith that Noah responded to God's word. In, in the natural, he had no evidence to believe this was going to happen. And walking by faith, sometimes we have to trust God with what we can't see that's not happened yet. And that's tricky because we all like to try and work it out. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day. We all like a plan. We all like it written down. We all like to know what's going to go on. But actually, when we walk with God, we need to trust him because he's got our future. You don't need to worry about what's going to happen. And Noah trusted God. And in response, he builds an ark. Now, this ark is the size of a football stadium. And he builds it with his sons. And, and you can imagine the ridicule and the grief that he got from the people around about him. What's going on, Noah? He said, there's going to be rain. What's rain? There's going to be a flood. What's a flood? I don't know, but I am trusting God for the not seen and the not yet. And do you know what? God saved Noah and his wife and his kids. He couldn't work it out. With his natural eyes and his natural mind, it probably seemed like a whole load of rubbish. But as he trusted God, God saw him through. So can you see that faith in God is in the not seen and the not yet? If you go on in the book of Hebrews, it starts to talk about Moses. And again, Moses is a great man of God. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had been grown up, refused to become the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to endure the hardship of the people of God rather than endure the passing pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ, that is the rebuke here that we would suffer for his faithful obedience to God, to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. He looked ahead to the reward, and in brackets in the, in the Amplified, he said, promised by God. By faith he left Egypt, being unafraid of the wrath of the king, for he endured steadfastly, having seen him who is unseen." So just like Noah, God speaks to Moses. He calls him as the champion. He calls him to see some miracles. He calls him to see all sorts of things. But when God calls him at the burning bush, it's not seen and it's not yet. Can you imagine? He's got a comfy life. He's in the palace with the, with the Pharaoh. He wants a cheese carb at six o'clock in the morning. He can ring a bell, wants a cup of tea any time. He can have one. The servants run everywhere for him. He has the cushiest life in all the world, all the gold, all the silver, all the servants. And yet as God speaks to him, he chooses to take a different route. He says, for he looked ahead to the reward promised by God. So something God had said that was not yet. And then by faith, he left Egypt being unafraid of the wrath of the king so he endured as seeing him who is unseen. So not yet and not seen. So like Moses, like Noah, Moses took steps of faith, trusting God for his future, even though he couldn't see it. Aren't you glad today that God has got your future and that you can trust him with every minute? You might not be able to see it. It's not happened yet. But I want to tell you, whatever happens, when we trust and put our faith and trust in Jesus, he looks after us. He's got us in the palm of his hand, as Gloria often says. Now, let me just show you how this faith thing works in the not seen and the not yet. And I think the greatest example of this, and all of us will be able to relate to this who know Jesus tonight, is our salvation. Because it's a prime example of how this faith thing operates, okay? And Romans 10, verse 13 to 14. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved but how will people call on him who have they have not believed how will they believe in him who have they have not heard how will they hear without a preacher and how will they they preach unless they are commissioned and sent faith 
for our future comes when we hear God's word. It's great to see some new people here tonight. I was out last night talking to Tom. He's recently given his life to the Lord. But what happened to him was that he started to read God's word and then God spoke to him and he put faith in Jesus and now he's assured of something he can't see. And even more than that, that not only he's now got a life with God now, but he's going to go to heaven one day when, when he leaves this earth. Because one of the things he was frightened about, mate, wasn't it, was, was dying and what happened after you die. You can be assured when we put our faith in Jesus, we can trust him. If I can trust him to take me to heaven, I can trust him to, to look after my family, can't I? If I could trust him with my salvation and for me to stand before God clean, I can trust him with my, my finances, I can trust him with my work, I can trust him with everything that I have. And, and th this is how faith how operates. As we take God at his word, there is a transformation that happens. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart a person believes, resulting in his justification, being freed from the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God. But with his mouth he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in this, confirming his salvation. Faith, the scripture says, comes from our heart. We believe God with our heart. Sometimes we don't understand. And I guess for every one of us, if I rewind back, I've told you this story a few times now, if I rewind back to the day that I got saved, I truly didn't understand what was happening but as God touched me and I responded to his word, I knew my life had been transformed. C can anybody say that? Andy went on a school trip. He wasn't expecting to hear from God. God spoke to him and he got saved on a school trip. Isn't that amazing? And, and for many of us, we, we have different experiences of how that moment happened. When Stace was stood here on that Sunday, suddenly God did something for her that, that was just incredible. And, but it's a heart thing, isn't it? It bypasses your mind. How it works, I have no idea. But this I do know, that when we put our faith in Jesus, he sets us free and he saves us. So faith is a heart transaction. And not only that, he says in this verse, it affects how we speak. We don't understand it, but we trust God. And we believe with our, with our heart, but we say it with our mouth. And here is a really big principle about faith. Don't ever, when you're walking with God, turn to the negative and say all sorts of negative things over your life. God doesn't respond to negative words. He responds to faith-filled words that are based on his word. And you've only got to look at the ministry of Jesus and he endorses people who have faith. He didn't say to people, great is your moaning. He said, great is your faith. Great is your crying and screaming and kicking up and saying that gods are not fair. No, he didn't say that. He said, your faith has made you well. There's a response that needs to come to us as we respond to God and to his word that actually we speak forth faith-filled words and then God meets us. And I was reading in Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, about the centurion who came to Jesus. And this is, this is an incredible story. I'll, re I'll read it to you. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies paralysed, suffering terribly. And then Jesus said to him, shall I, shall I come and heal him? I mean, if that was me, I'd say, yeah, come on, Jesus, come to my house. That'd be really great. I've heard about the miracles. But he didn't say that. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself are a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one to go and he goes. I tell one to come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at those following him. Truly I tell you, I have found no one with any faith like this. 
such great faith even in Israel. He commented on the centurion's faith that this man not only trusted God, but he took him at his word and he actually spoke it out as well. He said, look, don't worry about it, Jesus. I don't need you to come to my house. If you will just speak the word, then that's good enough for me. Sometimes we have to trust God when we don't get the goosebumps. You know, we all want to come to church for the charismatic. magic. Do you know what I mean? You know, the pastor will pray for me. Shabbat, abad, that We want all of that. But there are times when it's dark and it's hard and, it's, and everything seems against us. Then we say to God, I'm trusting you. Even though I can't see it, even though I don't feel it, even though it doesn't seem logical in my mind, I am trusting you with my life. And Jesus was big on the speaking the stuff. Not only believing it in their heart, but speaking it with the mouth. And this, this is one of the keys that most Christians don't get. You know, don't you ever hear, let me hear you say, I'm frightened to death. I'm not frightened to death. I'm committed to life, amen, because Jesus has saved me. But don't go around saying, I'm scared to death. What is that all about? I am not scared to death because I know who's got me. And when I die, I'm not, I'm not going to die as in, as in I'm not going to exist anymore. I am going to step out of this earth suit and I'm going to be absent for my body and present with the Lord. And then when Jesus comes, I'm getting a new body that's 15 stone lighter than this one. Praise the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm not frightened to death. Of course I'm not. We, we use some stupid words. I've told you before, don't go walking around going, oh, my arthritis. It's not your arthritis. You didn't buy it. You didn't want it. So why keep going around telling everybody it's yours? God wants to do stuff in us. But, he, but the enemy listens and the Lord listens to what we say all of the time. Believe me, what we say is incredibly important. And we need to fill our mouths with faithful words that give us strength and understanding. The word of God renews our mind and strengthens our spirit man. And you know, when we start to speak out words of faith, when we start saying to God what he's already said in his word, you know, we are, we are, we are then praying in agreement with God. You, can, you take a scripture and start believing it and praying it, then you're praying back to God the stuff that he's already promised. You can take that to the bank. And you know what, he, put God, he puts God back in the perspective of being God and all those fears and worries start to disappear. I'm not saying that we don't have fears and worries. And you know that on Sunday I'm preaching on mental health over these next few weeks. And thank God for what happened on Sunday. Just an incredible touch of the spirit. And I believe again this week God's going to do some other stuff. But you know we have to trust God with all of our lives. And sometimes they are difficult. But make sure that however difficult the walk you have at the moment is. Is that you are trusting God as a believer. And that you're putting faith filled words in your mouth. That you're not going around confessing negative stuff, but that you're going around confessing the word of God. I've told you the thing that I believe has changed my family from the day that Joshua was born till the day Joel was born and since. All three of my boys, I made a declaration of my faith every single day. All my sons will be taught by the Lord and great will be my children's peace. And I believe that God heard that and said, if Steve is believing my word, I'm standing with him. I think sometimes we just don't say it enough. Sometimes we don't declare it enough. Sometimes we're just too lackluster. We need to make faith declarations over our life. John, in his gospel in chapter 6 and verse 63, says this, It's the spirit who gives life and the flesh conveys no benefit. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. God's word is life to us. It's not just, here's the Bible, it's a book, there's some great stories, some lovely poetry, some songs that the Psalms are that you could sing, there's some history in there. It's more than that, it's the living word of God. And what he says in that book, you can put your feet on it and stand on it. If he says it, there's a song I've been listening to in my car, I was singing it on the top of my voice today. It's uh, one of the new songs. He says, if he says it, I believe it. He's a man of his word. Jesus is a man of his word. What Jesus said, in the red, you can believe every single word. What God has written in the book, called the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, you can believe with all of your heart. This is what we take our stand on in this church. And there are churches right across our nation right now that are just tearing bits out of the Bible and saying, well, that doesn't, that's not relevant today. That doesn't fit in with modern society. That's not working for me. 
Those churches will be closing. I tell you what, when we take our stand on God's word, God stands with us. And we need to be that kind of people, don't we? God's word brings us life. But other words bring destruction. So we need to put the word of God in our mouths. I love this proverb. Proverbs 20. Proverbs 4 verse 20. My son, pay attention to my words and be willing to learn them. Open your ears to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight, but keep them at the centre of your heart. Listen to this verse. For they are life to those that find them, and healing and health to all of their flesh. God's word is not just something written on the pages of a book. It's active, it's alive, it's healing, it's deliverance. As I was preaching about God wanting to set people free on Sunday, you know what God did? He set people free. When we declare the goodness of God, when we declare the promises of God, when we declare his character, God stands by it and says, that's me they're talking about. I'm going to come down and I'm going to visit them. And we need to put our trust in God and feed on his word. Keep on feeding our spirit man. You know, it really matters, and it's part of what I'm going to be saying on Sunday. It really matters what we think about. It really matters what we feed on. And uh, run away from negative words and fear-filled words and moaning and grumbling. And when you get yourself into a whole lot of trouble, don't moan about it. Just go and get into God's word and get that word in your mouth. Get it before your eyes. Get it in your heart. And believe God. And I'll tell you what, God will show up for you. I have learned over many, many years that when I have just taken God at his word, he's met me every single time and he's never let me down. We must be sure that we're trusting in God and his word, not what we think. And there's too much of that as well around, isn't there, at the moment? You know, I don't, I don't think that's the way it works. I don't, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think in our modern society that's what the Bible really said. no. The Bible means what it says. So we trust what God has said and what he has already written down. Don't you try and interpret in the light of modern thinking. Oh, well, you know, there's so many people now, and they don't believe that, and we'll offend them if we say what the Bible says, and if we take, if take the Bible literally, you know what's going to happen, don't you? Yeah, you know what's going to happen. We're going to get revival if we take the Bible literally. If we keep on peddling it down and watering it down, we're going to find ourselves in a whole deeper lot of hurt. We need to stand for the truth of God's word. And, the, and godly men and women right throughout the generations have stood on the word of God and saw God move on their behalf. Compromise in God's word never takes us anywhere. Uh, but we need to be sure that we are listening to God's word and making sure that it's him that's speaking to us, don't we? In the book of Ezekiel, there's this very, very powerful scripture as the prophet prophesies, and he, he's talking to the people about hearing God's voice or not hearing God's voice. And he says this, They have seen falsehood and lying divination, saying, The Lord says, but the Lord has not sent them. So there are certain people saying, This is what God's saying. And actually, God wasn't saying it at all. Yet they hope and make men hope for the confirmation of their word, not God's word, their word. Do you not see... A false vision and a lying divination when you say, the Lord declares, but I have not spoken. I've said it to so many of you before. Don't ever come here and play the God card. Don't ever say, God told me, if it's just an excuse. Because when somebody comes up to me and says, oh, God told me, generally what it means is, right, don't, don't ask me about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, and, and we use it as a card almost, like, you know, God told me, so no, I've got no retort against that, have I? Because you told me God told you. You better be sure that God told you, because that's be not using his name in vain. You know, when people say, don't take the Lord's name in vain, what they really mean is that somebody said something really rude about Jesus on a train or in, in the market or something when you were behind him in Dudley. I, I believe it goes further than that. I believe that you can use the Lord's name and say, oh, God told me, but he didn't tell you. That's using his name in vain also. So let's be honest, really honest about hearing the voice of God. Because God always wants to speak to us, but we need to ensure it's his voice. And in, in times to come over the next few weeks, I'm going to teach you how to hear the voice of God. Because it's important. Was it my voice? Was it somebody else's voice? Was it the enemy's voice? Or was it God's voice? But here's the scripture that I always get really excited about. And I've preached this so many times. 
And we're going to move into a whole session about hearing God's voice over these next few weeks and months that I've got with you at Bible school. But it's this, my sheep hear my voice. If we can hear God's voice and know it's God's voice, nobody's going to take us off at a tangent or down a side road. If we know it's God and we can trust it, then we can, we can stand firm, can't we? There are too many Christians that are pushed and pulled one way or another is that is, what did, is that God have I made it up in my own mind was it something I thought was it something I heard on the God channel and I mixed it up with something else was it something I read my sheep hear my voice and one thing I will say if you want to hear the voice of God get alone with him and keep on talking to him I have never once rung up Claire when I'm out and about from my mobile and I say, hello, chick. She's never said, who is this? Because she spends so much time with me, she knows it's me and puts the phone down. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what are you wrong for? You're supposed to be at work. Clear off. And she knows my voice because we have spent all of those years together. When Andy rings me up, I say, hello, mate. I don't say, who is this? Because he's my friend and I know his voice. And we as the people of God need to get that intimate in with God that we, we know his voice, don't we? So I know that voice. That's the voice of God. And some people often say to me, oh, how, how do you do it when you, when you walk up and down the aisle and you pray for people and God gives you a word? How do you know it's God? Because I've heard him before. And I know what he sounds like. And he talks to me in a black country accent. No, he doesn't. <laughs> No, no, but he, he talks to me. And I know it's him. I also know when it's not him. And I, know when it's, I also know when the voice of people trying to manipulate me and telling me it's God. But we, we need to hear his voice, don't we? Because that's when we can have true faith, when we understand God's voice. And we need to measure and judge everything by God's written word. We're those in this church that believe in the gifts of the Spirit. That we believe, we believe that we can hear God's voice and speak it out. But I'm telling you, God never, ever contradicts his written word, ever. That's why you know it's God, because he never changes his tune, does he? Never beats people up. You can't have faith in what you haven't heard. So we need to hear God's voice, don't we? And if he said it, we believe it. Because so, faith is not thinking positive or even confessing things that are positive. Faith is actually hearing God's voice and saying, that's you, Lord. I'm trusting you. And saying, God, if you said that, I'm trusting you and I believe it. I believe every word that you're saying to me. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. But the goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart and with a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some individuals have wandered away from these things into empty arguments and useless discussions. What he's saying is this. We want to be those that hear God's voice clearly. And we're not going to be those that wander away into empty arguments and useless discussions. I have been in some church meetings that have been full of empty arguments and useless discussions. When I was in the Methodist church, not that I'm saying anything against the Methodists at all, but I took a little journey into the Methodist church when I met Claire first. You know, when you fall in love, you'll do anything, won't you? So you can get, even get to the Methodist. So off I went. Off I went. And uh, for a while, I, I, we made our home in, in the Methodist church in Gornal. And I love those people. And some of them will be here in February to pray with us. And I love their leaders. And I want to tell you, they're, go they're godly people. But this, for, for, for sake of illustration, this little story, we, 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 went, we were invited to like a church meeting. That's like where they discuss business. I hate those things. I want to be in a meeting where the power of God is moving, amen? I want to be in a meeting where the Spirit of God is doing stuff. I, 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 don't, I don't want to be talking about, you know, what, what temperature we should put the heating on, shall we all have a vote? No, let's just put the heating on and get on with it. But anyway, so we get to this meeting, and uh, they started discussing what they were going to do with the Harvest Festival. You know, when you have the Harvest Festival and you get all the produce and they bring them great big you know cucumbers and whatever it's all lying out on the front marrows and whatever you grow in your garden so it's all on this so what are we going to do with the harvest festival an hour and a half they rowed 
In fact, the, 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 the vicar at the time, the minister at the time, he was brilliant. He took his hearing aids out. I thought that was a, I, I thought that was a stroke of genius, to be perfectly frank with you. I honestly, he took his hearing aids out. But you see what I'm trying to say here? As individuals and as a church, I, I want us to be in a place where we're hearing the voice of God, not having these endless discussions and arguments about things that don't really matter. Because what really matters is that people are set free. What really matters is the families are put back together again. What really matters is lives are changed. What really matters is the community knows that there is a God in heaven who loves them and has come to set them free from their addictions. We're that kind of church. And I never want to get to that other kind of church where we row for an hour and a half about what we do with a few tins and a couple of cucumbers. Amen. One version puts it this way. Faith does not presume... We don't presume on God, we trust him because of what he has said. It's very, very important. One of my, my favourite passages in the whole of the New Testament is found in John's Gospel. Uh, and it's Jesus, as he's preparing his disciples, he's telling them he's going away and if he's going away he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to explain a lot of things to them. And uh, i tell you what, if you're a new believer, read the Gospels and read the Gospels, and read the Gospels, because Jesus is amazing. And everything that he said is absolutely amazing. But he said this in John chapter 15, he said, If you remain in me, and my words, not your arguments, or your thoughts, or what you think, but if my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. For this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We need to abide in God's word. And, and this is a wonderful picture. I, as you know, me and gardening just do not go on at all. I'd, I'd tarm up the whole lot if it was down to me. But, but in a vineyard, the vines grow. And the branches of the vines that are connected to the vine produce the fruit. If you're not connected to the vine, you're not producing any fruit. And as believers here in this church, Jesus talks about remaining in his words or being connected to what he's saying. We want to be those that are connected to God's word, don't we? Because when we are properly and truly connected to God's word, that's when we grow and that's when we produce fruit. When we're not connected to God and his word, when we're more connected to what we think or what we're saying or we're more bothered about everything that's going on around us, I just want to encourage you all as believers here in this church, let's be those who are connected to the word of God. Because when we're connected to God's word and we believe it and we trust him, we're, kind of, we're feeding the fruit that's on the void and it's growing. And right now, God is doing some great things among us, isn't he? And I believe it's because it's this simple. All we're doing is praying and preaching God's word. We're not trying to be clever. I was saying to Andy this morning, we had a leaders meeting. I sat there to me, in my own armchair at home with the leaders around me and I thought, Shall I say to them, shall we get a plan for the next three months? And the Holy Spirit told me, shut up. Just do what I've been telling you to do. I, I, I just feel right there. Not because we are clueless, not because we don't have any thoughts about how the church should grow and go. Of course we do. You know, God put in a place of leadership. But I tell you something, when you connect with God and his word and you understand what he's saying, things happen a lot quicker than you could ever make it happen yourself. And we want to be those in this church that are hearing the voice of God. So we need to be connected, don't we? We need to remain in the vine. And we need to make sure that we're not just presuming, but that it's God's word that we're hearing. Now in Hebrews 11 and verse 29, again, we're talking about people that are doing things by faith. Scripture talks us about the children of Israel. They've come out of Egypt and they are, uh, they're about to go into the promised land. But, but before they get there, there's a real obstacle. It's called the Red Sea. And the Egyptian army is in front of them and the Red Sea is behind them and there is no way, it's an impasse and God speaks to them, he speaks to Moses and he says in Hebrews eleven twenty nine, by faith the people of God crossed the Red Sea as though they were passing through on dry land but the Egyptians were drowned in the attempt. I want you to see something here. The people of God, the people of, the, the God had brought out of uh, slavery and had, had brought out, when they put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels, 
were trapped. But when God said to Moses, walk through that sea, the miracle happened. They did not presume. It wasn't something, that wasn't a plan that Moses had written on the back of a fag packet and said to Aaron, I think that's a good idea. I think God could open the sea for us. No, no, he didn't do that. God said, they listened, they obeyed, and the Bible said they walked through like it was on dry land. Isn't that amazing? The walls of water just stood by the side and they walked through. It was like the M6, right straight through. Off they went. But the Egyptians came along and there was a presumption because the people of God walked through, we can get through as well. That's what you get for presuming, don't it? Really, because every Egyptian was drowned, the chariot wheels stuck in the mud, and then the waters came back and they're all drowned in the depths of the sea. Because it's not enough to say, oh, well, look at what's happening there. That... No, we don't presume. We only walk forward and see God move when we're obedient to what God says in his word. Really, really important. That's why over the last few months I've been saying to you in this church, we have a blank piece of paper. And we're only writing on it what God tells us to write on it. Because if I presume to start a youth group and say, it's a, it's a great idea that we reach the youth of Sedgley, isn't it just? If ever a generation needed Christ, it's this generation. But if we presume to start something just because we think it's a good idea and because we don't have a firm word from God and we don't have a direction from the commander-in-chief from heaven and then we just go and do what we want to do, we'll fall flat on our face and worse than that, we will be worn out and have to perpetuate something that we have created. But actually, when we hear the voice of God, God does something very powerful, doesn't he? When we heard the voice of God just a few months ago in the prayer meeting when he said, I'm going to send you 18 to 28-year-olds, that was a word from the Lord. I, I, I didn't make it up. God spoke to us. We prayed it through. And what's happened, we've seen an influx in our church of 18 to 28-year-olds in an unprecedented way. Not because we tried to make it happen, but the voice of God spoke and we said, we believe you. And we prayed in faith and we've been making our confession. And I've been going around, even though we didn't see any 28 to 18 year olds in our church, ministers would say to me, what's happening at Sedgley? I'll say, there's a load of 18 to 28 year olds coming. Not because I was presuming, not because I thought it would be a good idea. It's because I was taking my stand in faith on what God had said to us. We need to hear God for ourselves. And my big encouragement to us as a church is, you know, it's not enough that I hear to God. I'm not the Pope. I, I am not some kind of cardinal or priest where you have to hear me because I hear God. Aren't you glad that we belong to a church where we all truly believe that we can all hear the voice of God for ourselves? So if you can't come to church because you're poorly, or you can't come to church because you're on holiday, or you can't come to church because you're stuck on the M6 going to visit relatives, that you can still hear the voice of God and he can still speak into your heart and into your life. I was reading about the woman at the well. Another incredible story. And it says this in John chapter 4. Many more believed in him. And this is the amplified again, so this is in brackets with deep and abiding trust. So many believed in him, many put their faith in him, that's what the scripture is saying. Because of his word, his personal message to them. And they told the woman, that was the woman at the well, we no longer just believe because you said it, we now believe because we have heard him for ourselves and we have the confidence of assurance that this is the saviour of all the world. Isn't that amazing? And I want us to get to a place as a church where some of you come up to me and say, I don't just believe what God has been saying through you. I know it's true because he's spoken to me and I believe it myself. Not just about salvation, but about God keeping my family, God looking after my finances, God taking care of all that I need. We're not, we're not stupid in this church. We're not, we're not like these prosperity preachers that are going round. I'm not, I'm not buying a private jet next year just because things are going well. But I still believe that God can look after his people, don't you? Just like he looked after these Old Testament people, he wants to look after us. And I believe that he wants to speak to us. The greatest privilege we have as Christians 
is to hear the voice of God for ourselves. That there is no mediator. The Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So when I sin, I don't have to go to a little confession box and open the door and look through the grill and say to the priest, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I can be in my car driving down the road, convicted of something by the Holy Spirit, and say, Jesus, wash me. He'll say, okay, son, I'll sort you out. I don't need to find out a man to do that for me. Jesus has done it for every one of us. But I believe in the same way also. I don't need to go to a priest and say, what's the direction for our church then? Or what do you think about this for my family? I believe that as I pray as an individual, and you do as well, that God will speak to you. So that's why we need to take our Bibles, and that's why we need to take some time every day and read the Scriptures. It's not about educating our mind, so we know like all the names of the people in the Old Testament, all of those people nobody else knows. It's not some kind of Bible study quiz, do you know what I mean? It's not like Bible University Challenge, that you're more spiritual because you know everybody's name. I know all the Noah's sons and their wives and the dog. Ralph, I know it all. I've got it. I've got it written down in the back of my Bible. I, I, I don't read the Bible to get information. I read the Bible to hear the voice of God and get revelation, so I'm able to walk into my everyday life with all of its troubles and all of its difficulties, and know that God is going with me, and that I can trust Him with everything, not just some things, but with absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. So, I don't know about you, but I want, to, I want to be one of those people that walk by faith. And not by sight. Declaring the things that are not as if they were. I'm not declaring the things that are as if they weren't. I'm not saying, if I'm poorly, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm well. If I'm poorly. But I'm declaring that God says he'll heal me. God says he'll look after me. And whatever circumstance I find myself in, God's going to look after me. If I've got problems with money, I'm not going to say... Well, I'm not broke because I am broke. But I am going to confess my God will provide all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus because these are the words that he said, not what I said. So it doesn't matter how I feel or I think or, you know, what everybody else around me is saying. You Christians are all the same, you know, just trusting God for everything. No, I am trusting for everything. I'm taking my stand upon his word tonight because when we know the truth, the truth will set you free. I was blessed, but Hannah sent me a text after Sunday morning, and she won't mind me saying it. She says, it's absolutely true, Steve. Sometimes the truth roughs you up before it heals you. But I want to tell you, the truth always heals you in the end. And the truth of God's word, you can take your stand on it. So if you've, if you've been saved five minutes, five years, 50 years, it makes no difference. We all walk by faith, putting our faith and trust in God alone and in his word. Amen? Let's pray, shall we? Bless the Lord. Maybe you just want to take one of the circumstances you're finding yourself in right now and just lay it before Jesus and say, give me a word. Give me a word, Lord. Give me something from the scriptures that I can just hold on to. Maybe some of you have had some of those verses in the past and you've highlighted them in yellow in your Bible and they're shining out because they're like day glow, aren't they, with them highlighter pens. And, uh, but then you've just left it and you've not read it for months and well, maybe God said it, maybe he didn't. No, listen, if it's in his word, you can, you can take it to the bank. You can trust him with everything that he said. And so over our families right now, Lord, we, we trust you and we believe you. We make the confession over our families right now that all of our sons and daughters and grandchildren will be taught by the Lord. And great will be our children's peace. Over our finances, some of us who are struggling at the moment, we declare that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus that the Lord is my shepherd and I won't be in want and as David said I was young and now I'm old but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread all of these things we trust you with Lord even though our bank balance declares different even though our health screams that we're poorly Lord we, we just trust you with all that we are because you have written things in your word about us and we take our stand not on what we feel not on what we see but we trust in you for the not seen and the not now. We trust in you for the moments that are to come. We trust in you for the Lord, the future that we have together as a church and as individuals. And my prayer tonight, Lord, as I preach this for those that are online and those that are not, and those that are in the house right now, that Lord, whatever we've come in with tonight, 
that you would just set us free and that you give us that new sense of trust and purpose in placing all that we are on upon you and upon your word in the name of Jesus. Amen.